Good afternoon, everybody. You're very brave coming out on an afternoon like today. Um, it's, uh, it's incredibly hot outside, but um, it was 45 degrees coming, driving down from my place, uh, our place this afternoon. I've seen 46 degrees on my car, car thermometer, so we're, we're, we're very close to that record. The conference held its constituency meeting back in September last year and voted through four strategic goals for this conference for the next four years. Do you know what they are? Okay, growing spiritually, serving humanity, making disciples and proclaiming the gospel. Okay, so as a conference, we want everything to come under one of those umbrellas. Everything we do as church, everything we're about, all of the activities, all of the programs that we do, we want to be able to identify, well, that program, that activity meets that particular goal. Growing spiritually, serving humanity, making disciples and proclaiming the gospel. And that's the measure that our members will measure us by come the next constituency meeting in 2023. But we want those four things to be the driver of everything that we do, whether it's here in this office, whether it's in our schools, whether it's in our aged care facility, um, um, in our churches around the conference. And one of the things that, as Sven has said, that we're excited about is um, church planting. And the conference has invested heavily in church planting. Um, we've got Sven here as a full-time um, or working in the church pl planning department and I don't know of another conference around Australia that has a church planning director but we do in this conference so the conference is very heavily involved in church planting and wants to see that however I guess a phrase that we would use would be measured enthusiasm and excitement because while it's relatively easy to start a new group you know you can grab five or six people and go off and rent a community hall somewhere and start a new church plant but we want all of our new all of our church plants to be sustainable um, and to grow and to have a good future um, and to start for the right reason because some church plants can start for the wrong reason um, and and our church plants uh, must have a long-term future uh, we're prepared to invest resources and finances into making that happen, but um, they have to be sustainable um, and they have to have good leaders. And you are here this afternoon because you're good leaders. My wife and I had the privilege of working in the South Pacific for a couple of years back in the 90s. It was then uh, the Central Pacific Union Mission. It's now the uh, Trans-Pacific Union Mission. Um, and it covered from Fiji everything east from there right through to Pitcairn Island, although we didn't get out to Pitcairn at all because it's so isolated to, uh, to get to. But it covers Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, back then, uh, Cook Islands, French Polynesia. Um, when you think about, when we looked at the history of Christianity and how Christianity got to the Central Pacific, it's interesting to read stories and information about how missionaries left America, First of all, it was the Meth early Methodist missionaries that left, and then later on, Adventist missionaries came out. And it's interesting to note where most of those missionaries came from in America, or what part of America they came from, which was generally the northeast of the states. Now, what do we know about the northeast of America in terms of climate and culture and so forth? It's fairly cool. A bit more conservative. Okay. And so as those early missionaries came out and we praise God for the sacrifices that they made and some of them paid for it with their lives, as they came out, they brought a message, they brought a biblical message, a scriptural message, which we all believe in. But they brought a culture and a context as well. And it might have changed now because it's been a little while since we've been out there. But when we were there, particularly, uh, let me use Samoa as an example, okay? Okay. Now, Samoa is quite near the equator, and it gets very hot in Samoa, those of you who've been there. Um, we, we ran a, um, a number of programs there. One was a youth congress, but I remember being out there in August, and it was about 
It was about, uh, what, about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was about 90% humidity, and that was August. So it's a very um, hot place, okay? But at that stage in Samoa, you couldn't preach up the front without a jacket and a tie. Now, is that the way that Samoans normally dress? No. You could have thongs on, or flip-flops, as they call them, um, but you had to have a jacket and a tie. And if you were invited to a church anywhere in Samoa at that stage, and you didn't have a jacket or a tie, there would be some in the elders' rooms um, that they would loan you to preach in because you were not allowed to be up the front without one. But it wasn't just what the minister wore. It was even the style of worship, the order of service. And by the way, with the jackets and ties, if, uh, you, didn't, if you had to use one of the jackets that was in the elders' room, um, you were very cautious to put your hands in the pockets because that was where the dead cockroaches were, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it was, it, so it was the order of service, but it was even the architecture. And, then, and some of the churches there are built like, like this building, um, high walls and then a few windows along the top in the tropical heat because that's the way that they built churches back in the States. Okay? So it wasn't just the message that the early missionaries came out with, but it was the culture and the context that they brought with them. And I can remember, and, and uh, we loved our time out there, and, the, and Polynesian folk are incredibly generous and warm-hearted. And, um, but, you know, I can remember being out there as, a, as an Australian and having preached, and, you know, it was, it was pretty warm, standing at the door, and the perspiration is just dripping off you because the humidity is so high and it's extremely uncomfortable. So we have to think about what is the culture, what is the context in which we are planting churches here in this country? And yes, we're not going to compromise our message. We are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian denomination. And God has given us a prophetic message to share with the world. But what's the context in which we are going to do that? I remember listening to a presentation once a speaker um, challenged us uh, to think of a large city around the world, one that you've been to, one that you might know, one that you might have lived in, perhaps, a large city. Think about that city. My wife and I have just spent the last eight years in Sydney. Think about the city that you've got in your minds. It might be here, it might be somewhere overseas. What would you say would be the major needs of that city? Now, the speaker who was making the presentation was thinking of um, a city in uh, a country other than Australia. And this is what he came up with in terms of uh, the needs of that city. Hunger. Human trafficking. Homelessness and health. And I'd probably add another one there, hopelessness. People wanting hope. So as we think about our context, and I'm sure you've done this exercise with the group that you're working with or with your leadership team, what are the H's in your in your context, not necessarily words starting with the letter H, but what are the needs in your community? In a conference that uh, Sven and I have worked in together, um, you know, you would think that that hopefully with the with the situation in in a place like the Central Pacific where the early missionaries imposed their dress, their architecture, their style of worship on another culture, that we would have learnt the lesson from that. But there was a church plant that, uh, that um, we're aware of where 
First of all, it started for the wrong reason because there were a group of people in another larger church that couldn't get on with everybody else and so they thought they would start a new church plant. But then in terms of the style of worship and the way that they did their church plants, they were really just making another little Adventist church that mirrored the worship style of the big one. So there was the normal Sabbath school, there was the normal worship service, there were the three hymns and the prayer, and there's nothing wrong with it, that order of service. But in order to reach the community, they hadn't really thought about what are the needs of the people around where we live? How can we build relationships with them? How can we get to know them? How can we get involved in this community? Let me take you to a passage of scripture, if you've got your Bibles or your devices, to Acts chapter 17. The book of Acts chapter 17, and we'll read from verse 16. Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be... Sorry, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For I was passing through and considered the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands. And so on, he goes to talk about the God of heaven. You know, these people were very religious, which is interesting. That today, we operate in a very secular society and people general well becoming less and less religious, but there's still a level of spirituality amongst people. Still interested in spiritual things, not necessarily religion. And here Paul is uh, talking, uh, or yeah, talking to them about this, this idol that's in their midst. And just in case they hadn't covered all of the idols that they should have covered, they had one to the unknown God. So in this passage... Where is Paul? Not the city where he is, but where is he? He's finding common grounds. Peter. It is Peter, isn't it? Band. Got it. He's on their turf. Thank you, Kent. He's on their turf. He's in their space. He's talking to them about things of interest to them. He's using something that belongs to them, something familiar, something in their culture to spark interest and to build relationships. Thanks, Van. Yes, he did go to the synagogue and he worshipped with the Jews and the Gentiles who had been converted to Christianity. But the Bible says that every day he was in the marketplace. He was on their turf. Now, as I mentioned, please don't understand me. When we're not talking, we're, sorry, we're talking, what we're talking about is not the message, but it's the method or the context in which we present that message. 
what we're talking about is culture and style. As Adventists, we have long traditions in terms of Sabbath school and church. My wife and I worshipped at Wall's End this morning, and we looked up on the website, 9.30 for Sabbath school, 11, 11 o'clock for the divine service, because some churches start at 10 or whatever. But what if, we're, what if worship for the people in your context works, for, works on Friday night? Or what if it works on late Sabbath afternoon at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock? Sven and I were privileged to go on a healthy churches tour. So this is a group, um, an Indian church plant in the city of New York that we had the privilege to go to. And if I remember correctly, Sven, they started their worship about 5 or 5.15 Sabbath afternoon because that's when people in the Indian community were available to come. They'd done their shopping, they'd done the things that they wanted to do and that was the time that people were, able to, that people were mostly available And uh, you can see some of the traditional dress there of some of the folk um, who were there. Uh, You can see on the little table to the left one of the traditional musical instruments that they, uh, they used in their worship. It wasn't English worship. It wasn't Caucasian worship. It was Indian worship. I mean, we couldn't sing a word of any of the songs. And praise the Lord for that because they were doing it. They were doing worship in their context, reaching their community at a time that was relevant to the people that they were reaching out to. Jesus is our example in all things. By the way, and you probably know the answer to this, here in Australia, you know how people, we've just had Australia Day, how people... uh, Uh, become Australian citizens and they have the citizen um, ceremonies all around the place. What's 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 the country that has the most people becoming Australian citizens here in Australia at the moment? What country are they from? Canada? No? No? India. India. Currently in Australia... The top country of people migrating to this country is from Britain. The second one, China. The third one, India. And one of the challenges we face in this conference is what are we doing to reach Indian folk in our region? And it's, it will be a few years where there will be more Indians coming to Australia than from any other country around the world. Jesus is our example in all things. Luke 4, 16, he went to the synagogue every Sabbath. But he also spent time, spent most of his ministry with people in the towns, in the villages, going to wedding feasts and functions in people's homes, mixing with the community, building relationships with people and inviting them to follow him. 